We have been on a new series uh, on uh, the empowered life. And we talk about how in the Bible we all know in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that uh, the Bible says that we shall receive uh, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us and we shall be witnesses in the Lord. Plus, we all do know the privilege of being born again. How we are new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. And that now we are able to uh, uh, be called sons uh, and, and children of God, sons and daughters of God. Surely that is a position of power. Yet in our Christian life, as we walk in our Christian life, a lot of Christians seem to constantly be defeated, pressed down, and uh, so something is wrong between what we have theoretically and theologically and what we have in practice. And that's the gap that we try to address. Uh, why is it that the Bible says like that and the Bible says we are this and here we are doing this life? And uh, so the gap is what we are trying to address. And as we look at the empowered life, uh, we will look at several areas here, how to bring forth the empowered life. Now, we will go to the Bible and look at all the various verses, but I'd like to start off today by reading a news article, and uh, this news article is from uh, newsweek.com, and uh, the article is dated about um, uh, 10th of uh, July 2011, so it's a recent article. Because, uh, uh, and I love the science part, and I keep up to date on a lot of science research. And uh, here, they analyze why winners win. So they analyze some of the uh, tennis players. And uh, so, and I, I like this part of the science. It says, uh, on this section here, it says, this is your brain on winning. So they analyze what was happening within a person's consciousness and physical brain says uh, it was analyzed tennis players. says the movements of the tennis player, how you are when you watch the tennis players, especially uh, the champions, those who are number one. Uh, we're not looking at uh, the, those below uh, number four, five, six. We're looking at, of course, later some of them will rise up. But we're looking at why people are number one, number two, number three. And apparently, there are a lot of talented people. But somehow, in spite of the talent, they cannot win. Some of you have watched tennis games and, uh, and you see, wow, this guy got a unique way of playing, but they just cannot win. What's the difference between having a talent and being able to win? Well, this is what the secular world is analyzing. And then we will look at what the Bible is analyzing. So the Bible must have answers to all this. And so when they analyze a tennis player, they say the moments of elite Athletes are beautiful to watch. Yes, indeed. When you watch the number one players. And uh, it's always been for me in Australia. We love sports. And every time they have the Australian Open, uh, we, we watch when the best players are, are playing, uh, see, going their way to number one. But we always usually watch the, the semifinals and also the finals uh, because you love to watch those good players uh, confronting each other. It says, but what goes on inside their heads? The best players learn their moves by encoding whole sequences in their cerebellum. That's a part of the brain. In the cerebellum, I read all these funny words that may sound funny to you, and afterward we explain. They encode all this in their cerebellum through intensive practice. As you know, next year is the London Olympics. And right now, all the athletes are practicing. Most of them, for Australians, they're getting up early in the morning. They, might, they may do whatever they need for four or five hours. And all for a few minutes of glory in the Olympic Games. And, um, so, intensive practice. And then, in game situations, activate them without conscious thought. You notice the key here. See, if you got to think and play, okay, now I should do this, now I should do that, you will lose your tennis 15-0 all the time. You cannot be thinking. You should be doing. 
So apparently they have to move from their conscious practice till it becomes a subconscious. Because when the ball is coming against you and is 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 hit by either uh, Federer or Rafael Nadal, okay, any one of you play them, we all might get minus one. <laughs> Not 15 0, 15 minus 1. Why? Because we are disgraced to the game when compared to them. But when we play with each other, it's not bad. We probably may win sometimes and lose sometimes. Uh, playing against these people, you've got no time to think. And because uh, all the thinking should have been done long ago, you've got time only to react in your subconscious. So, this is what the scientists have analyzed. And they said they practice intensely and get it into the cerebellum. And then in game situations, act them without conscious thought. To return a serve, for instance, a tennis player uses their thalamus, which is a part of the brain, to focus on the opponent, while the prefrontal cortex quashes all distractions. Visual information from the occipital lobe, which is at the back, activates the unconscious motor program in their basal ganglia, <laughs> which passes instruction to the posterior parietal cortex, which cells, which calls up automatic movements, and the premotor cortex, a staging ground for complex movements. The premotor transmits commands to the motor cortex, which orders the muscle movement swing. Wow, all this thinking taking place in the brain. No wonder most people cannot be good tennis players. <laughs> it has to go so much into the subconscious uh, and uh, so much training and so much talent that is uh, involved uh, in just uh, one of these uh, games. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> when we consider that, then uh, there is also a little article about uh, one of the players, uh, Andre Agassi. As you know, Agassi is not like one of those players with a very powerful body and, uh, uh, or powerful strokes. Uh, like uh, you know, Federer has this fantastic surf and uh, so one of the new young players coming up has a fantastic uh, uh, surf. Uh, if any one of us uh, who are amateurs try to take his surf, we cannot, every time he surf, we are zero. Cannot even take his serve. Anyone play table tennis, you know, when a fast ball comes, you cannot even take the serve. And you just don't know how to respond to that. And um, so, Agassi, this was uh, his true story. Uh, Andre Agassi was losing. Losing a lot. After a meteoric rise, a me meteoric rise, to his professional tennis career, which we all have seen. We have seen a lot of, of, uh, of young prodigies in their sports. They rise up. We see them young. They definitely got talent. Then they rise, they become professional, but cannot win. Of course, they still make a lot of money through advertising. But uh, they still cannot win. We all, everybody loves a winner. So you say, why with such talent, they cannot be number one? That was Agassi's problem. And though he rose into the professional tennis career, with the best return and fastest reflexes in the game. As you know, nowadays they measure the ball, measure everything, the movement. Agassi has become a chronic underachiever by the early 1990s. Dropping early matches, choking in the finals, and uh, then in the end, in March 1994, he was set to lose again, badly, this time to Pete Sampras, who had been nearly incapacitated by food poisoning just moments before the match was begin. Imagine, your opponent got food poisoning, still win you. <laughs> and this is a professional tennis, you're getting worried. Say, okay, if that's so bad, what's, how, how is it going to improve his game? Now, for them, it's a living. They don't improve, they start making less and less money until they just rejects among the people. Talented people, but rejects. So it was important for him to turn around. Uh, remember, this story applies to business, to any area, to ministry, and every area. And the same way, what differentiates a, a, a mega church person from a, one who cannot get into a mega church? What differentiates a mega ministry for a ministry that cannot? What differentiates the quality? So it can apply to spiritual area. 
and you can apply to natural, natural areas uh, in your business, in whatever. What causes a person to win? That was this article. And so here he is losing, <coughs> frustrated and rudderless, Agassi agreed to have dinner with a pro prospective new coach. A man whose tennis he didn't much admire. Why? His new coach is, was not a great player. Not a great player. Not among the top, top, top champions. And his name was Brad Gilbert. Brad Gilbert was the anti Agassi. See, what anti Agassi? No talent. Not much that I mean, God can play, but not much gifted talent. But the special thing about this guy was he once in a while could eke out a win over a great player. So you say, how can this guy win against that player? You know, the shocking defeats. Like recently, I think yesterday or so, your, your Singapore player beat the number one badminton or something, wasn't it? But the thing is how not just to beat him once in a while and people call it a fluke. I know because we play chess all the time as a chess champion and I enjoy and we play. And so sometimes you beat a good player and say, is that a fluke or is that you really got the skill to constantly beat? <coughs> so when I read this article, I also say, ah, if only I knew some of this truth earlier, you know, I could maintain uh, the chess championships uh, a bit longer. And uh, because uh, <coughs> there is a principle behind. And uh, so here it says here, that uh, when he got his Brad Gilbert, a moderately, a moderately talented junker, who in his own career had, had uh, eked out matches, he had no right to win. He had normally no right to win. He's less talented than the more talented player. His book about tactics, just published, was titled, and Brad wrote a book called Winning ugly. <laughs> Winning ugly. And so Agassi saw the book and he wanted to learn from this guy. And so Agassi wanted an honest assessment of his game. Why did he keep losing to less skillful players? And uh, Gilbert exoriated him for trying to play with perfection. He got good scoring from this guy. Instead of Risking a killer shot on every point, why not keep the ball in play and give the other guy a chance to lose? That's an interesting approach. And uh, it's all about your head, man, Gilbert said to Agassi. Agassi recalls in his, in his memoir. So Agassi did write about this guy, Gilbert, how he changed his life. Uh, in his memoir called Open. With your talent, if you're 50% game-wise, but 95% head-wise, you're going to win. But if you're 95% game-wise and 50% head-wise, you're going to lose, lose, lose. Agassi hired him on the spot. An, imme an immediate losing streak ensued. As Gilbert raised and rebuilt his game, but gradually Agassé began to pull out wins in matches that the old Agassé would have lost. And five months later, he bulldozed his way to his first US Open Championship. I fall on to my knees, Agassé writes, of the moment in the Open. My eyes fill with tears. I took to my box, you know everything you need to know, about people when you see their faces as the moment's greatest triumph. I believe in Brad's talent from the beginning. But now seeing his pure, unrestrained happiness for me, I believe unrestrainingly in him. At last, his head was clear. Symbolically and seismically, Agassé shaved his iconic uh, glam locks. You know, he got long hair and he shaved it. And punk Sampras in four sets to win his second straight Grand Slam. In 1995, Aust Australian Open en route to his first career number one ranking, there will be more losses, many more in his long career, 
But Agassi now has learned how to win. What was it that he learned? Uh, and which again are applied to chess. You see, uh, in, in playing chess, you are very, it can be very aggressive to win. But there's another philosophy involved. You not only must have the talent to want to win, and sometimes by wanting to win so much, you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, your opponent exploits your mistake, you lose the game, even though you're more talented. Why? The opponent plays passively, waits for you to make a mistake. So now, Agassé was learning how to not be too aggressive, but to just maintain the game and allow the opponent to make mistakes. Being human, as I mentioned, if two persons play tennis, and they keep playing, one will lose. Why? Because the one will make a mistake. That is why in heaven, nobody plays tennis anymore. Or badminton. Or football. Or any games. Now, some of you are going to say, wow, heaven so, so not so, so boring. No, there are other things more interesting. The reason is, if you have tennis in heaven, and you're standing on the other heavenly court, I'm on this side, I serve you a ball, you serve me the ball, I serve you a ball, I serve you, and we'll be playing for the next 1,000 years, why nobody make mistakes? After 1,000 years, we're still on the first ball. Because I don't make a mistake catching the ball, you don't make a mistake catching the ball, it becomes very boring. Until, you know, you might as well read the Bible while playing. <laughs> yeah? That's what you could do. <laughs> so, part of winning and losing involves the other guy losing. And so, Agassi was taught, to maintain his position so that when the other guy starts making mistakes, his stroke of brilliance comes in to take advantage of the mistake. But of course, you, we all know that in sports, it's a combination. Sometimes you've got to be aggressive and all those. You see some people win games because they're aggressive. But apparently, they have to be tempered uh, in this. So there was a mental change that came into his being. And the end result of this article, it says that basically, Involved in winning, there is the need and desire to win. They call it dominance. But dominance alone won't make you a winner. It's the state of calmness you must have. And in that state of calmness, with the streak of dominance, that's what they conclude to be a winner. That's from the secular world. Now, as we, before we look into the Bible, we, some of us need to revise our our Form 5 Biology. So I have uh, a little chart for you before I go into this. Is it, is it going to apply to the Bible? Yes, it will. <laughs> it will apply to the Bible afterwards. Uh, this one, we study more in detail in the second service in the Mind of Christ. And all my messages are put online free. So you are not there. You can always refer to them. <laughs> and uh, this is, okay, How to Grow a Better Brain. That's a funny title. Uh, that's not what we're trying to do, right? We j I just like this page because you've got a diagram of the brain in color, easy to understand. So your brain weighs three pounds and blah, 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 and everything. But let's go to all the different sections of the brain. The lobes of the brain, okay, this drawing. Okay, all the different parts of the brain that you saw just now, I read to you. What was happening inside the tennis <coughs> player's brain while he was playing tennis? And so we go down further. Uh, basically, it has these four lobes that are there. Uh, the frontal lobe. And uh, frontal lobe is found in the area around your forehead. Of course, right in the front is cerebral cortex. And it's concerned with emotions, reasoning, planning, movement, parts of speech. It also involves in purposeful acts such as creativity, judgment, problem solving, planning. So all those things are in your front part of your brain. Your front part is analyzing, reasoning, making decisions. And uh, so there's a, 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 cent, a part right in the front, a cerebral cortex that is even more developed as an adult than as a teenager. So you use the frontal part of your brain. Then there is, you notice a part called the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobes are found behind the frontal lobes, above the temporal lobe. So it's right about here. And at the top back of the brain. Now remember, there are two sides of it. You're only seeing one side. There's left and right side too. And, uh, but that's too complex, so we just show one side. Uh, at the top of the brain, they are connected with the processing of nerve impulses related to the senses, such as touch, pain, taste, pressure, temperature. They also have language functions. 
that are there. And we go to the next one. The temporal lobe, which is here. This sounds like a biology class. Some people come and say, if someone show up and say, hey, is this church or is this a lecture on biology? This is temporarily. Just bear with me for a few, uh, one, or, uh, one to two minutes. <coughs> the temporal lobe are found on either side of the brain and just above the ears. Right? It does handle audio things. It says the temporal lobes are responsible for hearing, memory, meaning, and language. They also play a role in emotion and learning. The temporal lobes are concerned with interpreting and processing auditory stimuli. So, all the hearing. And of course, you have the visual side, your occipital lobe, which has to do with your vision, your seeing. And I believe uh, part of activating your, your imagination also involves this part of your brain. The occipital lobe is found in the back of the brain. Occipital lobe is involved with the brain's ability to recognize objects. It's responsible for our vision. Now, beside these four lobes, let's go further down. Uh, the neurons, most of you know it. And uh, all the different cells. And then, okay, then the subparts of the brain. The cerebral cortex, right in the front. And uh, controls your thinking, voluntary movements, language, reasoning, perception. And uh, uh, so, anyway, it talks about the size and everything. Then your cerebellum, the part that we mentioned, where, where you store all your, uh, uh, the training, your practice. Uh, the cerebellum uh, is cauliflower shape. You, know, you love cauliflowers? Eat more. The Chinese, you know, everything looks the same. You eat must be helping the same. Right? <laughs> Funny Chinese philosophy. <laughs> anyway, it looks cauliflower. And the cerebellum controls your movement, balance, posture, coordination. New research has also linked it to thinking, novelty, and emotions. And the uh, word cerebellum originally came from the Latin word little brain. And it's next to the occipital area and the brain stem. It's lower part of the brain. And uh, then you have, uh, here is a hypothalamus. It's part of the limbic system. It's located on the internal portion of the brain under the thalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus controls your body temperature, emotions, hunger, thirst, appetite, digestion, sleep, and go on down. Yes. And then you have uh, thalamus, uh, part of the limbic system. Okay. And uh, then the pituitary gland. This gland now, it controls your hormones, as you all know. The pineal gland. Pineal gland controls your growing, maturing. Uh, the amygdala, which is uh, uh, right near your brain stem. Uh, they control your emotions, such as regulating when you're happy or, or mad. Uh, your amygdala is important. Without it, you could win the lottery and feel nothing. You wouldn't be happy. So there's emotions that are there. And uh, in long ago, in, uh, I think there was an article, uh, someone who had operation and his amygdala was, was affected. He found that the person keeps repeating the same actions. Say why? He made a mistake, he still keep doing it. Why? Because he couldn't feel the, the pain and the regret or the mistake. So to him, it's like nothing. And uh, so that's an important part of us in our decision making. Hypocampus, uh, and uh, it forms and stores your memory. Scientists think that other things are known about the hippocampus and it's involved in learning. And uh, then we go on to another part. The midbrain it, uh, controls your breathing reflexes and your swallowing reflexes. So these are all different parts of the brain. Some are glands, some are different sections of the brain. And uh, what we have done is we have studied uh, the word my, M-I-N-D, from the Hebrew word perspective. And uh, we have a Mind of Christ series 1, which introduces a subject taught in the 1990s. Mind of Christ 2, taught about a year or so ago which we study all the Greek words on the word mind. As you know, in the Bible, there's more than one Greek word translated mind. Some of the simple ones uh, people have begun to learn, and uh, there's the word dianoia, which is the visual part of your, your mind, dialogismos, the logical part of your mind, and uh, then uh, entomasis, which is the, the emotional part of your mind, and different aspects of our mind we study in the Greek word. Recently, and that's uh, just uh, uh, over a few weeks, we have studied the Hebrew words for mind. We study the mind of Christ tree. And the Hebrew word for mind is totally different from the English, which will give you the chart that we have made on the, on the various Hebrew words for mind, knowing, and, uh, and learning. 
on uh, on what I call a comparative chart. Comparative chart. Uh, it's a word document. Yes. So this is what we study, and we did this on the mind of Christ in second service. Uh, strangely, the word "my" in the Hebrew, and I have a printout of every Hebrew word where the word mind occur in the Old Testament. Not that many, actually. Not as many as in the New. New actually beats the Old. And uh, most of the time, it's the Hebrew word lap, which is strangely hard. It's the actual word that refer to heart in the Hebrew. And that's the most common word for mind in the Hebrew. The other most common word is the word nafesh. Uh, which is actually soul. It's like the Greek word suke, soul. And uh, it's the word mind. And then there's the word ruah, which is actually, we all know the word by now, if you have been in Christianity long enough, ruah is actually the Hebrew word for spirit, which comes from breath. But breath has been used of the mind, like in Genesis 26 verse 35, when Isaac was, had a grief of mind, it says whatever uh, Esau did was a grief of ruah to Isaac. So it's funny. He used the word spirit instead of mind. And uh, then it has Yetzer, which we have a whole series of teaching on Yetzer. And uh, actually, we introduced the subject of Yetzer to Christianity uh, when we look into that area. Many people have picked up Dianoia, Dialogismos, Yetzer. can trace it back in the early days when we introduced some of these words. Uh, in deep study. And uh, then, Yetzer has to do with imagination. We have a whole study on that. Strangely, there's another word, and it's used one time in the Old Testament, but it relates to the mind too. It's the word pay in Hebrew, which is the word for mouth rather than mind. It seems that uh, when you say something, it involves another part of your mind. As you know, the Chinese used to make people memorize by rote. When you're memorizing something, we all know our analytical mind is not involved. In fact, some of us say, ah, waste of time, I'm not getting this, I'm not understanding this. But yet, we keep on repeating the thing. Apparently, it triggers a different part of the mind. So the word mouth in the Hebrew uh, has, the, uh, has to do with, with, uh, 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 with the word mind at least one time, quoted in the book of Leviticus. And uh, then there are two words that is not the word mind, but I have to bring it forth because the mind remembers. So there's a Hebrew word zaka, which is called remember. And then the word know, we know with our mind, N-O-W, K-N-N-O-W. is the Hebrew word yada. So what I have done, and this whole study here, we're studying in the second service, Mind of Christ 3. And uh, I have analyzed the Chinese yin and yang and how it relates to possibly different parts of our mind and the Hebrew words. And I've analyzed uh, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, Hindu and Buddhism. They have the seven chakras. And uh, I, again, when I mention that, I want you to be very clear, I do not believe in those things. I do not subscribe to those things. But yet, we analyze everything. And then we look at what the Bible says. And uh, so truth is never afraid of confronting error. So a lot of Christians will say, oh, just believe the truth, believe the truth, don't have to uh, do all those things. I know not all Christians are capable to handle uh, errors and all that. But it's the job of the preacher, the job of a teacher, the job of a Bible scholar to confront with an open mind, to receive every possible thing and see it from the Bible perspective. Truth should never be afraid to confront every philosophy and teaching that is out in the secular world. Because we all need answers. We need to know what the Bible says. And so we can tell you what the Bible says about this area. And uh, <coughs> then uh, I relate in the end to all the different ways we can know. Uh, there's an there's a inner knowing, feeling knowing, you feel and you know. There's a heart knowing, there's a visual knowing, there's a physical knowing, there's a cognitive knowing. And uh, there's an experiential knowing. So there's so many ways that we know. That we are not aware of. That uh, we're going to relate how this relates to the empowered life. Now, I've related uh, under the brain side and the gland side. These are the two biological areas. Uh, different parts of the brain, how it relates to the seven Hebrew words for, for mind, knowing and understanding. 
Of course, in the brain side, there's nothing to do, no spirit, so I have to put spirit there. And uh, then uh, and, uh, I relate here uh, the soul and, uh, and the cerebellum, uh, hypothalamus, amygdala, all these seem to relate to soul functions. Uh, our emotions, our happiness, you know, amygdala, you feel happy, you feel sad. And so I divided all the various lobes and parts of the brain. And uh, then uh, where it relates to heart, I uh, put the thalamus and midbrain, the center part, the processing. And imagination, I relate to the occipital lobe, your visual part. And uh, then uh, to malfunction, I relate to the parietal lobe, temporal lobe. And uh, remembering, which re depends on the hippocampus. And this is a learning process. Uh, if your hippocampus is uh, uh, destroyed or affected, you will straight away be unable to learn anything. So that re learning is a remembering process. And uh, then there is a cerebral uh, cortex and the frontal lobe. So this section is what we are looking at. So you ask a question, why are we doing this today? Because here is where I bring it forth to you. There are many, uh, if you look carefully, there are many functions of the mind. And there are possibly seven types of thoughts that are going on inside us. And the key to the empowered life is to be able to distinguish the thoughts that come from the spirit. This is what we want. We are aiming to be spiritual people. We want the thoughts that come from the Spirit. The Spirit, I repeat, is 100% right all the time. The soul, depending on how renewed it is and how much information is fed into it, may be right for some people 50% of the time, some people 70% of the time, some people 30% of the time, depending on how renewed their soul is. And, uh, and their soul would include, of course, you know, their, their analytical power. And in fact, your Prime Minister, long ago in, in, in your, your Singapore history, when he was seeking to develop uh, your Singapore nation from uh, a new nation that has all, need, all kinds of needs into a powerful nation, and he, he actually went to Sydney about... Uh, how long ago was so that? Several years ago, probably. I was that time in Canberra, so it must be about five odd years ago. And uh, they had a talk that was organized by Citibank. And, uh, uh, and, and they, we were, uh, together with one of my architect friends, we were invited to attend a talk by the High Commissioner. I happened to come to know the High Commissioner in Canberra. So uh, he says, would you guys like to attend? So I said, okay, can I bring my friend? And he brought my friend. And uh, so... When there and your prime minister in his, uh, he was talking about it, and he said the same thing. He said that he adopted it from a shell, the shell company philosophy, the, the shell, the, 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 the petrol company, uh, and and he found three things that he adopted in, into your country. One uh, was um, um, three things, and uh, that he got all his cabinet ministers and all that. He says he looked for people with the power of analysis. People who could analyze, right? take information and analyze powerfully. So very thorough analysis. And then he looked for people who got great imagination, creativity. They could think outside the box. And thirdly, and these were adopted from the Shell Corporation. And thirdly, which was very important to him, they are also grounded. You know, you have the two and then people are not practical, pragmatism. And uh, you could imagine it as long as you can. Like right now, you could imagine. You could spend your whole lifetime uh, imagining antimatter engines. Right? It, it might take, you know, if Jesus tarries, it might take a thousand years before human ca can handle antimatter energy, uh, matter, antimatter engine. So, you know, our lifetime is too short. And uh, to be practical, you know, you know it's good. Give some time to research, but don't give 100% of your research uh, to something that cannot be a possibility today. And uh, so that is third, grounded. Uh, they're practical. Uh, it's something useful. They're rooted on this. Uh, rooted in reality, he calls it. Uh, uh, that is real. It can actually work. And uh, so, well, uh, uh, whatever, whatever fault some of you might find with him, 
he did build a great country. And uh, he did build a great, uh, uh, brought, uh, brought some, a lot of success where many countries could have uh, gone down the drain. And uh, so, in that sense, uh, you find that uh, there are, uh, the basic thing is, uh, to have the empowered life, we need to handle our thoughts. They are there. So that's it. And, and so we close that for now. And uh, so where are we in the Bible when we talk about the empowered life? Okay, let me introduce some of these scriptures here. Apparently, the Bible has already said, in, it's a theological fact, and it's a, it's a final fact, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, we are born again. We have the new mind in Christ. We are a new creation in Christ. We'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's how to have that translated into our real life today. The empowered life. And so the Bible does give us clue on the how to translate between the two. The Bible expects us to be able to tap into that realm. And uh, so in the book of um, uh, Romans, Romans, Book of Romans chapter 8, after telling us that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, and chapter uh, 8 verse 1, and how in verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, after telling us all these things, it goes to the practical side in verse 4, uh, that we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Then your question, how to walk in the spirit? How does it actually flow? Yes, I know it's in the Bible, but how do we actually walk in the Spirit? Do we like, you know, some, of course, you know, you got all these crazy Christians, one, yeah, they think Spirit is something, oh, <laughs> you know, oh, they're not in the Spirit. You know, they frighten everybody. You know, if every Christian go about town like that, oh, we all will be locked up in a mental asylum, right? So the church will be in the mental asylum. Obviously, you know, we all have different personalities. Some people would react in that manner. But spirit cannot be just like that. Because how do we know? Did Jesus go about walking? Oh. <laughs> Jesus didn't. So Jesus is our pattern. Uh, I, I know you might find a few individuals here and there who are proponents of walking the spirit and their walk is like that. But the question is, I don't compare them with anyone. I don't compare them to any famous person, a mega church person, or mega ministry person. I say, I compare them to Jesus. If, it's, if, if Jesus walked normally, then, and yet he's the most powerful spirit being, obviously he is our pattern. Everybody else is an imperfect pattern. If they hit it right, then that's fine. And so we are supposed to be able to walk in the spirit. And it says here in verse 5 onwards, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So obviously there's a choice there. There's a choice that we'll be given or what kind of mind we have. That immediately tells you, okay, there's two choices. How do we know whether our mind is spirit or our mind is carnal? Uh, it's not necessarily, you know, very clear cut sometimes when it comes to a lot of decisions that we make. Is that a carnal decision? Is that a spiritual decision? And what happens if it's a carnal decision clothed with spiritual reasons? So that confuses the whole thing. You know, we've got spiritual reasons, but the whole thing is actually carnal. What makes it carnal? What makes it spiritual? Is it just the Ten Commandments that make it carnal? No, there's more than the Ten Commandments. We are beyond the Ten Commandments now to go further than that. So obviously you can see those range of thoughts that are possible. And in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he obviously is telling something about operation of the mind and thought flow that is there. When he, when he speaks and tells us there, uh, talking about the wisdom of God in verse 21, the wisdom of God, uh, verse 21, for since... In the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Then it says in verse 25, The foolishness of God is wiser than man. The weakness of God is stronger than man. And then in chapter 2, he talks about how this mind operates. He talks in verse 9, the promise, I has not seen nor ear heard, 
nor enter into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. So obviously there are some things that God has. And verse 10, God has revealed them to us. Hey, the things that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and uh, things which God has prepared for us, it says in verse 10, He has revealed them to us. If He has revealed, how come we still don't know? Obviously, He's revealing, but we're not seeing. He's, he's speaking, but we're not hearing. And uh, some, something is blocking. Either we don't know how to hear, we don't know how to receive, and uh, so we cannot live the empowered life. It says here, The Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. Then he goes on to an interesting uh, predicament. He says that we ourselves don't know. He said, that's terrible. If we don't know, how can we tap away? Apparently, another part of us know, our spirit. It says here, uh, the things of a man, no man knows except the spirit of man inside. And we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. And then he says, verse 13, the things that we speak are not in words, which man's wisdom. That means the normal function of your analytical power, your cerebellum, your your, 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 your uh, no, cerebral cortex and all those things, not the normal function, as something else that flows in you, which the Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Verse 14, the natural man, everything of your biological function, your natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They must be discerned from the Spirit, not from your soul, not from your physical dimension. And then it says here, in verse uh, 16, Who knows the mind of the Lord, that He may instruct Him? He says, we have the mind of Christ. So suddenly it turns around and says, hey, we've got the mind of Christ. If we have the mind of Christ, logic dictates that we would have some of His thoughts flowing to us. Because the mind of Christ does think. So if we have the mind of Christ somewhere within us, that mind of Christ has a lot of ideas. That mind of Christ within us knows exactly what to do in any situation we are in. That mind of Christ will always have the solution to every problem. That mind of Christ will within us know what is the answer, what to do, where to go, where to be. That mind of Christ is within us. It says, it didn't say we shall have. It says we have. We have. So if we have, is functioning, that mind of Christ is thinking, are we catching the thoughts? Is the question. So let me throw small scriptures to show forth this area in Ephesians chapter, chapter 3. So you know that what we are wrestling with is scriptural. Even though we introduce the subject with all these areas. In Ephesians chapter 3, and I tie all these things together. Ephesians chapter 3, let me bring more Bible first. It says here, in the prayer that he prayed for the Ephesians in verse 16, he prayed that God would grant the Ephesians, grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Apparently, we all have an inner man. But that inner man needs to be strengthened. And he prayed that it be strengthened. And that word strengthened is the word from the Greek word dunamis. Same Greek word as Acts 1 verse 8. Power. Translated power. That word dunamis here is used in an internal sense. So your empowerment is from the inside out. So he prays for an inner power, inner dunamis. That is strengthened with kratos or might through the Spirit in the inner man to be in us. Because Christ is dwelling in us. Obviously, if we have an outer man and an inner man, we all must listen to our inner man. But inner man is just not, not just something in your brain and thoughts. You say, oh, my thoughts are hidden from everyone and are internal, therefore they are from the inner man. Wrong. Your thoughts can be an outer man thought. So there's an inner man thought and outer man thought. Because some of you struggle so much until you think you're ultra man. <laughs> but inner man, outer man. Say, what la like inner man, outer man? What, what kind of, what man are you? We all have an inner man. It's the inner man 
that needs to be strengthened and empowered. We talk about the empowered life in this series. And it's an important series. How to tap on the power within. That's what we're heading for. And today we give you another key to tap on the power that is already inside, within us. For all of your daily life thing. And then it says here in verse uh, 20, To him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. Obviously what we ask or think comes from us. But it says God is able to do beyond what we think. It shows us there's a lot of things to tap on. And he didn't leave this subject in chapter 3. In chapter 4, he continues on this subject, Ephesians 4. And says here in verse 22, 23, and 24. He says that you put off concerning your former conduct, put off the old man. Oh, now we get more confused. Old man, outer man, inner man, ultra man. <laughs> How do we go about this? And he says, the old man, and obviously old man refer to the old self, our old way of thinking, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So apparently there's a part of the mind. And when you look at this from the normal English perspective of mind, because mind is part of our soul. And if you have watched man needs uh, spirit, soul and body, uh, mind will be a part of the soul. But here, if you look at the Hebrew word for mind, which we introduce to you, one of the Hebrew words for mind is the word ruah, which is the spirit part of your mind. So it's telling let all of your mind, whether it be your cerebellum part, your uh, cerebral cortex or whichever your soul part or with your analytical part all of your part be renewed from your spirit part of your mind so the spirit part of our mind must take precedence it is true that in our society today you know different different civilizations emphasize different things in our civilization today the prefrontal cortex is number one because it's uh, today's heroes are those who are inventors, smart people, smartness, smartness, and high IQ are something that people aspire for. Great ability to think, and uh, today's people who are successful, their ability to think through, get the things. Uh, except for sports people, sports people um, might not necessarily have, they don't, you, when you want to play sports, they say, okay, let me measure your IQ. No, when you play sports, they just want to see whether you, you got a talent, you know, with the skills of your body. It's a different part of your brain that functions. Uh, and is well connected in the area. And long ago, the heroes of the Roman Empire were those with pugilistic skills. They can fight. <laughs> So they can fight, they become king. They might be a dumb king. But they can fight. And there is a part of their brain engaged in analytical thing. But all the analytical thing is how to kill. How to kill well. They look at you, they start looking at 20 ways to kill you. They look at another my empire, think of 20. So they do use, now I'm not saying they don't use their, their cerebral cortex or all this. They do. But the emphasis in the end is their pugilistic skill, their ability to, to wipe out another and destroy another person. And uh, so the best warrior wins. And so it's a, it's a different part. Society emphasizes a different part of, uh, of heroes uh, today. And <clears throat> as we look, there is one part. When you look at the Bible, who are our Bible heroes? And... You can be skillful in a natural thing, and skillful in intellectual thing. But we know that Jesus is our hero. If Jesus is our hero, 
who is Jesus and what part of Jesus' mind was most well developed? His spirit. He even tells us his spirit grew. And, and his spirit grew to the extent that his spirit could understand how to take the things of the spirit and even produce things in the natural. Multiplication of bread. And he had power over the physical world. And uh, he could heal. Sickness were no match for him. And diseases were no match for him. Demons were no match for him. Natural lack of, was also no, no match for him. He could walk on water. He could multiply bread. So he demonstrated a spiritual power that is super, supreme above all. That is to be tapped on. And we know from the Bible, the reason we learn the Bible is we realize that when you have a spiritual blessing, it results in natural blessing. We see in Abraham's life, we see the power of blessing on Jacob's life carry on right through. We see the power of impartation when Joseph blessed, Joseph's son was blessed by Jacob. And, uh, and just because uh, the son, uh, one of the sons, Manasseh, was blessed even more, uh, he multiplied as a whole tribe greater than all the other tribes. We see the power of blessing resulting in natural prosperity, natural health, natural healing. And we see also, uh, Jesus is our hero, but we got a lot of Bible heroes. Daniel shows us, with spiritual ability in God, he could master any science or literature or wisdom of the Chaldeans, which is the Babylonian Empire, ten times smarter. So imagine how much his IQ was. And we saw how overnight Solomon could just receive such a super IQ that he could talk about birds, bees, and plants, and animals, and everything else Because God gave him wisdom. So apparently, for God to touch any part of a cerebral cortex or cerebellum or anything is easy. Because even in the natural, we saw how Elijah, when the rain was coming down, it says he told uh, the king, it says, you know, uh, be warned, there is a sound of the abundance of rain. And then uh, the king started his chariot. And Elijah, he ran. He didn't have any chariot, no horses. He ran. But he reached the gate faster than the king. So you could imagine the king was riding as hard as he can on his chariot. And this is a horse we're talking about. And then suddenly, you know, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Elijah running. Like Billy the Wiz. Reached the gate before him. So some part of his his brain that affects his motor function was somehow enhanced, and I can tell you, if that kind of anointing come on any of you, the Olymp- Olympic Games, eh? <laughs> lost to you. <laughs> Apparently, there's possibility of the spiritual affecting the natural. This is what we're talking about, the empowered life. Why is it that with such power that we have in Christianity, is not being tapped upon? And we are given you scriptures to show that here, it's always letting us Go back to tap upon that. How do you put off your old man? So many people don't even know how to put off their old man. Say, how? So they end up with funny teaching that says they've got to physically do it. <laughs> well, every morning, <laughs> just like putting on the armor, every morning they must, tung, tung, you, know, you know, the armor, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, girdle of truth, shoes of the gospel of peace, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. So every morning they get up, they go, tung, and then they go out. <laughs> right. And uh, <coughs> every morning they go through that, you know, and they have to make a confession. Now, I'm not uh, no, I'm making fun of anybody, but, but if, if you started that way, that's fine. At least a good start. And uh, then until you discover that, uh, that every morning you did it, then my next question is if every morning you did it, then. What happened between the, mo- the, the night and the morning? Do you take off the armor? That means every morning before you sleep, you will, uh, every, every morning you go, how do you go there? Ding, 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 ding. Some effects are mine, right? <laughs> then you go out. 
uh, with all those things. Then in the night, you also got to dong, dong, chik, dong, chik, dong, chik, dong, chik, dong, and then you go, ah, sleep. Correct. Then next morning, you got to put it on again. But wait, the devil got no off day. The devil also works at night. You think the devil works 9 to 5. Then everybody retire. Peace. So when you take out all your armor, at night, the devil will attack you, of course. So you're supposed to sleep with your armor. So if you sleep with your armor, then, and every day you put on a new armor, wow, very thick. <laughs> Try wearing 10 pairs of clothing, right? <laughs> very uncomfortable. And... Uh, <coughs> So obviously, putting on the armor is an understanding. It's something that you've got to understand within you, and you tap on. And the same like how to put off the old man, how to put on the new man, is a big question. How to be renewed in the spirit of the mind. Then he says in verse 24, put on the new man. Say, well, how to do it? Anybody knows how to do it? It is a put off. So is it like, take off your old man, you hang it on the closet, then somehow you reach higher. Oh, that's the new one. Put on. Wait, how do you know this is new and that is old? <laughs> what, what is this thing that we are doing? How do we actually put on a new man? Good question. Remember to ask that question before I finish. Otherwise, I didn't tell you how. And uh, then with all these things, you also have these powerful scriptures like uh, 1 John 2.27. They talk about the anointing that is inside us. 1 John 2.27 says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Wow, that's the Holy Spirit. You do not need anyone to teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it's true, it's not a lie, just as he has taught you, you will abide in him. So apparently there's something within you can teach you all things. And not forgetting all the scriptures of uh, Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, 16, talk about the Holy Spirit when he comes. He will teach you all things. He will lead you into all truth. And uh, He will show you things to come. All those things of the Holy Spirit. Wonderful things. And here it comes to where we call the rubber hits the road. The brass tacks. What is it actually flowing forth? So to put in very plain, simple English. As you saw all the listing of the different Hebrew words and all that. And in actual fact, it is how you live your life at which level of consciousness. Obviously, the spirit man, inner man in us has to be deep inside our subconscious. And then you have uh, uh, your conscious mind. So let's look at the spiritual and the physical and the soul from consciousness. After all, consciousness is what we are and who we are. We start from the fact that we all can actually analyze things. When you're thinking and analyzing, you're using your brain. That is your internal consciousness. And within each one of us is an inner voice that talks to ourselves. That inner voice is a thinking process. That is your mental consciousness. So obviously, there are different levels of consciousness within us. And as I show you from the, from, the, uh, from the tennis games, the tennis player cannot rely on his consciousness alone when he plays a game. His consciousness can be part of his training. But when it comes to actually playing a game, he relies actually a lot. He, he uses his conscious mind to say, his pre his, uh, his, his uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, uh, prefrontal lobe and cerebral cortex is used to cancel out all distraction. So his, uh, his consciousness is pushed out every consciousness except one thing. And he's relying a lot on his subconscious all the time to win. In his other training, he got to keep reprogram pro reprogramming himself. So obviously, if a tennis player has to live life at the subconscious, and the subconscious is where you're going to find a calm. And sometimes in the movies, they try to express that. You remember how in the movies, 
uh, those with mutant powers uh, from the early days of the Incredible Hulk. How did the Incredible Hulk, uh, who was uh, uh, overdosed by gamma radiation, become the Incredible Hulk? Every time he got angry, he go, <laughs> and boom, the Hulk comes out of him. Always the shirt there, the trousers there. But he never lose his trousers. <laughs> Must be rubber bag. Right? No? If you look at it biologically, his trousers also should tear. And, uh, so always he keeps his trousers just so that you, the children can watch the movie. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, then you have some of these uh, 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 recent these mutant powers. Now notice that the hard one leans to emotions. And you've got a lot of new TV series, sci-fi that comes that talk about mutant, mutant powers. And notice, every time they talk about those things, the way to, for them in their movies, not saying that that is the truth in the movies, was for them to rely on some part of themselves beyond their cerebral cortex. Either their emotions or their sense of it. And in some of the most recent movie on uh, X-Men First Class, uh, there is this guy who is the bad guy. I forgot his name. Uh, the one who could stop matter. Magneto. Yeah, Magneto. Uh, Magneto was learning, before, before he became Magneto, he could control metals. And uh, so he was trying to get, get, the, get his power out. So remember how he challenged his power? And, uh, and it starts with the, him as a young boy, and, and they want him to demonstrate power he could not. And then when his mother was shot, he got angry, his power came out. Related to emotion. And so in the end, when, when uh, Professor X or Savior was trying to get him to harness his power, that he, got, he in the end has to find a place between anger and calm. That's just a movie story. But all movie stories came from people's cleverness and idea. They must have done some study. In fact, some movies, they, they, they do some studies before they, 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 they do it. Here we see that there's a scientific research that for a person to win, a winner's temperament, is they found their calm while retaining their aggression to dominate the winning age. How does all this relate into the Bible? Now, let me show in the Bible how important the subconscious is. It affects us all the time and we are not aware of it. By not being aware of our subconscious, you are already disempowered. See, you want to learn the empowerment, you got to see the opposite side. So let me show how uh, people are subconsciously without knowing who they are. But in the end, the Bible story shows them that's what they became, that's what they are. And uh, <clears throat> let's look at uh, uh, Jacob and Isaac, some famous stories. And look at the, the negative one first. We see here <coughs> that uh, Isaac, uh, <coughs> Isaac got married and uh, Isaac have children. In chapter 26 of Genesis, chapter 26 of Genesis, we see Isaac and went to Abimelech's time. <coughs> And, uh, and Isaac built an altar to the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> oh, chapter 25. Yes, we got it. <clears throat> In verse 28 it says, When they have twins, the twins are, are dissimilar twins, and uh, they are not uh, the same. Uh, one was hairy, one was smooth skin. And verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Obviously, verse 28, this is an imperfect situation. How do, does Isaac love Esau more? Because of the food. And, uh, and Rebekah loved Jacob more, probably because Jacob was a domestic person who, who loves to cook and loves to help around the house. <coughs> but that, although it's a statement, it's a statement that tells you that subconsciously that was affecting their family relationship. And you know, children know if you love one more than the other. 
Children know more if one is more uh, favorite than the other. That happened to Joseph, by the way. Now, in that kind of atmosphere, you see uh, this rivalry between the, the two boys. And in verse 29, Jacob cooked a stew. Esau came in from the field and he was weary. Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with the same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. Esau said, Look, I am about to die. What is this birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright. So Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. He ate and drank, arose and went his way. Esau despised his birthright. When you read this story, you'd see the actual happening. How old were the boys at that time? Maybe in their late teens, but most likely in their twenties or more. What you see here is an actual incident. But what you don't see is the subconscious attitude Jacob always have to Esau. You have to read between the lines. So obviously, Jacob never liked his brother to be older. He wants to be the one older. That was in his subconscious. By the time he one day had an opportunity to challenge his brother, it was only the uh, straw that broke the camel's back that came out. Inside the camel is already having a lot of weight. He's already bearing this thing subconsciously for so long. And he suddenly came out in that incident. It was not a brand new idea he thought of. He was thinking of that subconsciously. It was in his heart subconsciously. And so, when the opportunity came, he caught his brother off guard. And his brother wanted something so badly. The day the brother wanted something so badly, he took opportunity. So what was guiding his life? the subconscious desire to take something from his brother. That was his guiding principle all the time. They were in rivalry. What about Esau's subconscious? Esau subconsciously was never, although he said Esau despised his birthright by that action, let me tell you, Esau already despised his birthright subconsciously years and years down the road. Years before. He already didn't care about that. He already despised it. But it just came out in the action. It was the subconscious that affected the action. All of us right now, whether you like it or not, are being affected by your subconscious. We think we are that smart. We think we got high IQs. We think we are well-trained. We think we are, we, are, we, are, we are very educated. We are still affected by our subconscious. Now, if you are aware that life is now being run more by the subconscious than the conscious, the conscious just makes the decision. The conscious mind that they make a decision. Oh yes, give me your birthright. But the subconscious was already there, running the show. And the conscious mind may think that it's king. The conscious mind was just a clerk. Maybe the conscious mind with training is a manager, understands something. But the king and the power source was the subconscious. If we all understand and accept this fact, that whether we like it or not, we are, we are being driven by something subconsciously within us. The key is to make sure that whatever is running our consciousness right now is the right subconscious. Because there is a wrong subconscious and a right subconscious. There is an inner part of our soul. In his soul, Esau and Jacob did not get along. Jacob hated Esau for being born number one. In his soul, Esau had no relationship with God and despised his spiritual birthright. And you see that happening even in the story of Joseph and Jacob's 
uh, in chapter 37. In Genesis 37, verse 3, Jacob was of course also called Israel. And saying in verse 3, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. The Bible never tells you why. But you have the answer in the Bible. Because he grew up with parents who love the child unequally. By default, he also did the same. All children should be loved equally. No matter whether they are adopted or they are your own biological children, whatever, if you want them to be your children, you love them equally. And uh, here, Jacob loved Joseph. Now, what was causing Joseph, uh, uh, Jacob to do that? His subconscious process of learning. And of course, Joseph soaked it all in. And Joseph, although it's not mentioned, I can tell you, Joseph, because of the condition he was brought in, inherited part of his father's attitude to his other brothers. He quote-unquote had a little despise to them, see them a bit lower. Okay, as you can see in verse 2, Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Always talk bad about them. That is not just a conscious thing. There was something con subconscious going on that drove the family situation. By the time the family situation came to the point that the brothers were boiling over because on top of that, Joseph got a dream. And his dream was they're going to be dominated by him. They're already subconsciously angry, of course. Subconsciously, they were really upset and angry. That was their, their thing. And finally, the straw that broke the camel's back came. A situation when one day, they say, okay, here comes a dreamer. Let's get rid of him. Why do they want to get rid of him? Subconsciously, they are not being loved. Of course, in their mind, they thought, get rid of him, now the father's love is for them. But that didn't happen either. Everything that you saw happening in the Bible was a lot of subconscious things going on behind the scene. Sometimes, even uh, men of God are affected without realizing it. In the book of 1 Samuel, we all know that Samuel was a child of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Samuel's home situation was not that good because... Samuel's real biological family, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Elkanah had two wives, Manina and Hannah. And they were always fighting. The first wife and second wife, always fighting. And uh, Hannah was the second wife, and uh, she uh, was despised because she got no children. And she's uh, very sorrowful and troubled because in those days it's very important. And uh, finally, she has Samuel. And she promised to give Samuel to the Lord. So whatever semblance of family Samuel had, even if he was in their home for a while, was a bad situation. There's always this fighting at, a, at home. Then when he was adopted by the priest Eli, Eli's family was also dysfunctional. Eli's children despised the things of the Lord and uh, they slept with the women in the temple. They, they take pieces of offering before the offering was burned, finished. And they did things that the Lord also didn't, didn't like. And Eli was warned about his children. So there was a dysfunctional family. Samuel grew up in that background. Samuel was a child, from a child he heard God's voice. As far as his anointing, his gifting, everything was there. But there was a vacuum in Samuel's life. Subconsciously. When Samuel was an adult, he got married. In chapter 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Samuel was old. He made his sons judges over Israel. That was a big mistake. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Bathsheba. But verse 3, 
His sons did not walk in his way. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. They behaved exactly like Eli's sons. Maybe they might have some actual influence. Maybe they had some ties there. But where did Samuel get all these things from? Where did his son? You know, all this behavior is learned. It's not just genetic. Otherwise, everyone can blame genetic. Nature is part of it. A predisposition to anything can be nature. But in the end, it's nurture that seals the deal. Otherwise, all of us cannot be judged. We are judged because it is still our decision. So they were still responsible for their choice to be who they are. So we ask the question, why did Samuel fail as a father? He never had a father. A real father. It was in his subconscious. Can you imagine? The mistakes of the subconscious produce a national you know, tragedy. Tragedy. The subconscious were affecting people all the time. And then think about the incident about uh, Sam, uh, uh, David. Uh, David and Saul. Between David and Saul, everything should have been good. Everything should be okay. After all, Samuel, uh, after Saul, uh, David did love Saul. David did marry his daughter. And as far as David is concerned, he respected and he loved Saul. But Saul didn't love David. Saul was a different type of man in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. We are told that after David came to the scene and David was anointed and David killed Goliath in chapter 18. Everything, they should have lived happily ever after. I mean, uh, after David uh, was married, Michal. But even before that, in chapter 18, verse 7. One day when King Saul was going by the streets and the women were singing, they sang and they danced in chapter 18, verse 7. And they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Tell you, Saul never liked that song. He didn't like it because subconsciously he was insecure. What's wrong? I mean, David was a more talented man than Saul, actually. So if a highly talented man has adulation, you recognize, thank God that that highly talented man is serving with you. See, you don't have to have the highest high IQ to be king. All you have to do is to be smart enough to handle the people with smart IQ. And David was highly talented, skillful. He should be grateful. Wow, I got one of the most skillful men serving under me. And later on, he became his son-in-law. They could have been the fairy tale story and they live happily ever after. Instead, they got the opposite fairy tale story and they live unhappily ever after. <laughs> always quarreling, always having all, all kinds of problems. Remember, all this is subconscious. Did Saul do anything? No. But he was very angry. So, when something happened in your home, in your family, suddenly you're angry. Why? Subconsciously. Something was the tip of the iceberg, a straw that broke the camel's back. And you ask a question, how can a straw break a camel's back? Interesting English expression. A straw cannot break camel's Camel's hair is stronger than a straw. <laughs> Don't talk about his back. But the expression is, something that should not break you, breaks you. Because you're already broken inside. So full of those wrong things. And Saul exploded with anger. And verse 8, the saying displeased him. And verse 9, he gave David the evil eye. He even said the Bible, I like the King James say, So Saul eyed David from that day forward. So from that day over, his eye go. Was there anything consciously done? Nothing. Everything was subconscious. And that subconscious motivation or insecurity or fear 
caused Saul to do many, many things. He threw spears at David, threw spear at his own son, Jonathan. He did things to his own daughter. When, when David ran away, took his daughter who loved David and remarried her away, he did all those things and used his daughter as bait to try to kill David. All kinds of, a thousand and one actions from just one subconscious bottle bubbling up. So I show all these stories to show the subconscious has a tremendous effect on many people in the Bible. Even David is a whole, another whole story about his subconscious. And remember how uh, David, when he cut Saul's rope, he was smoked in his heart. Apparently David could tell different consciousness within him. His men were saying, kill Saul in a cave. David, in his mind, said, okay, I won't kill him, I'll just take a piece of his rope. That was his mind telling him. But another part of his, his, his spirit mind tell him when he cut off the rope, another part said, this is wrong. See, he was having internal conversations within him, different levels of consciousness. In the New Testament, you have this uh, guy called uh, Simeon in Acts chapter, look at the book, Acts chapter 8. Mm. Yeah, no, Acts chapter 8. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, yes. There was this sorcerer called Simon the Magician. Now, Simon in chapter 8, verse 9, was actually a famous person in the secular. He practiced sorcery in the city, astonished the people of Samaria, claimed that he was someone great, and they all paid attention to him. He must have made a lot of money. And in the end, in verse 13, Simon became a believer. He became a born-again Christian. So one day, Peter and John came down to pray for the people who were already born again to be empowered by the Spirit, to receive the baptism of the Spirit. It says in verse 17, they lay hands on them and they received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, Acts 8, 18. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hand, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. He had to buy the power. Now you see his action, but read his subconscious. What made him like that? Subconsciously, he was always using money to buy things. So automatically, he did the same thing. But while he was being rebuked, Peter pointed to something going on in his subconscious that he himself doesn't know. It says in verse 20, Peter says, Your money perish with you because your, you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. That is a wrong thought anyway. In verse 21, You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart, that is deep in your subconscious, your heart is not right in the sight of God. Verse 22, Repent of this, your wickedness. Wow, he, he has some wickedness inside him. And who knows, it could lead to worse things. And pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. So look, there's something motivating him. And Peter says, that thing that is going on in the inside, that needs to be dealt with. And verse 23, I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. That was his subconscious state. Remember, he's born again, baptized in water, believe in Jesus Christ. But his subconscious was all out of whack. Poison and bitter. bitter. So again, we ask the question, could Simon have lived the victorious Christian life left to himself? I don't think so. I think he will continue to stumble in his Christian life. He will try to push himself higher. After all, he wants he want to go higher. Not, not a bad thing. It's not wrong to desire gifts or power. But he might desire it for the wrong reasons. And some other things is going on in his life that could <coughs> destroy him. I wonder how many Christians subconsciously have that going on in their life. And remember this statement we say again. Whether we like it or not, your subconscious is driving you. Thus, blessed is the man or woman who understands what's going on truly inside them. 
then you can correct whatever is inside <coughs> before <coughs> it results in the wrong thing. But that is brings you to zero still. What is even more powerful is what we are introducing to you. If you really tap on the true part of your subconscious, <coughs> because you will have, you will feel your own internal thoughts as, as a uh, internal. You will sense your subconscious mind, which is part of your soul. And you can sense an inner part of you called the inner man, the new man, which is at a deeper level of your subconscious, <coughs> flowing within you. So the key in the Christian life to be empowered is to tap on, using religious words, to tap on the inner power of Christ within but to use more secular words so we can convey the meaning is to tap upon the subconscious thoughts that flow from you every day. And as I say, they are, there is many knowing. There is an intellectual knowing. There is a feeling knowing. There is a uh, visual knowing in your imagination, there is an intuitive knowing that all these thoughts that are flowing inside us. And some of you might say, wow, how can I tell all the different thoughts within me floating? You could tell by their quality, by the quality, with training. The word helps you. Like, what is, you know, some people, they sing out a key. But those who are trained, you know, I'm not sure whether I'm that good, but those who are trained, they could go uh, like, I'm trying to hit a G key. Oops, I was out. But those who are very good, so I'm really, I was flat just now. But those who are got good tone, you can tell them, give me a G, they go, Oh, give me a C. Uh, they, they, they could give it to you. Why internal training? They know the tones. So they are trained to, 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 <coughs> to get, to hit the right note. And then hitting the right note is not with their conscious mind. Because sounds, some part of their memory system, which is not in their logic system, could pick the sound. So they could go, you know. Of course, we learn the do, re, mi. So you get the do right, you get everything right. You get the do wrong, everything is wrong. And uh, but some people their do re mi also all flat. Yeah, they cannot sing do re mi in the right uh, 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 modulation. <coughs> we can learn, just as like you can learn tones, you can learn the differentiate tones. And the more you sing, the more you you know. Some people, because even if you give them the the chord, those who are flat cannot even sing the right key. They need to wait for someone to sing first. So. So you go, so straight away you know, ah, then a ah, me, you know. So some people you give that note, they still cannot catch a note. It's some training within us that as you keep on learning and you can do it, same with thoughts. Now let me talk about your physical body too. There's also a training. Like for example, how many of you here can move your ears? <coughs> I know some of you can sound. I know you are one of those who can. Can you move your ears for a while? Okay, okay, okay. Can you see his ears moving? Okay, he sees. Uh, I also can move my ears. Go. See, my ears are flapping. If they were bigger, I would be Dumbo the elephant. <laughs> and so, now, moving the ears doesn't involve ear muscles. It involves the muscles in your cheek area. So, those of you who cannot move your ear, and uh, not that it's, it's important training, not so important. And, uh, it might be part of your NS one day. Who knows? They put something in your ear and they move. <laughs> anyway, and, and so you move your ears by concentrating on your muscles that cause you to green. You know, a green. Try to smile cheek to cheek. Right? So when you, it's a part of your muscle. So once you get to know that muscle and you sort of can pull that muscle. Right, it's here and at the back near your ear. It's, it's the muscle around the ear, not the ear muscle. 
Correct, you could feel it. So you move the ear muscle. I could feel this part of the muscle moving. Yes, go ahead, try it if you can. Oh, so oh, always move ear. Say, so what kind of session is this? Move ear session. Next. Okay. Now, how many of you can bend your, your, your finger where, uh, where you know, your, your digits got three notes? Bend the last note like that. Without, without using your hand. Can be done. Can be done. See, I did it. Can be done. So it's just the last thing. But it's a lot of tension. I got to send the energy out to the muscle and, 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 and bend while this part is pushing it straight. It's two muscles involved. One muscle forcing this digit to be straight. The other muscle pulling it down. So it takes a lot of energy. More energy than flapping the ear. <laughs> okay. And a simpler one, not so difficult. Okay. Uh, they have, and actually, you know, when, when the Vulcans in Star Trek say, uh, no, uh, live long and prosper, this sign came from the Jews, actually. It's one of the Jewish blessings. And when they did make the movie, they researched the Jewish thing. You know how movies like to take some things, even the names of some movies come from old research. I was surprised sometimes I do my research. Hey, I say this movie took from that research. And uh, so, uh, not everybody could do this with their hands, right? Oh, <laughs> so you can do that. And the key to do that actually is to actually relax your hand. When you bend it, when your hand is bent, your hand can separate. Uh, so some of you might do it with your hand like that, separate. And then slowly you get used to the muscle, then you straighten it. See, so it could teach you how to do it by acquiring the muscle. So you see, there are muscles in our body that we have not acclimatized to. That if someone show it to you, you can find that muscle. It might take time, but you can find that muscle. Of course, but don't waste too much time in those things. No, don't want, want you to do devotion, read the Bible. Don't want uh, the whole three hours you're trying to move your ear. <laughs> it might not benefit you spiritually. And what we want you to do is, the more important thing is this, to understand the different thoughts that float to you. See, when David was cutting out Saul's rope, another thought came to him. And it is more the feeling inner thought that came out. So all of us, if you want to live a powerful, empowered life, the secret is this, to, to be able to hear the thoughts. That, the thing about the inner man and the hidden man is that he does not think as much as he takes from the spirit and bring it up. The thoughts flow, and I try to describe technically what it's like. When your inner man speaks and the inner voice, you know they got so many inner voices. Some of you got so many inner voices. Wow, you got Indian, Indian, you know, oh no, Martian and the tongues and all. You got too many voices in you. You're so confused. But whatever inner voice you have inside you, they are slightly different in, quantity, in quality. So that you could train yourself so you know, okay, I'm beginning to feel, uh, and you know the thoughts that, you know the thoughts that come from your cerebral cortex, the one that is you analyzing. So you recognize that it's your own thoughts. And then you recognize thoughts that come to you from your uh, uh, emotional or the taste sensation. It could be suddenly the thoughts of durian. And if you love durian, your reaction will be your saliva starts tripping. And uh, then uh, if you don't like durian, you begin to have a funny facial expression. But you love durian, you go, oh. So the thoughts of durian and all this taste, and as we are nearer and nearer to lunchtime now, <laughs> if you begin to think of food and what to eat, which partly comes from your stomach's hunger and you initiate it, and you begin to desire certain food, that one came from another part of your brain. Pregnant women have a lot of different thoughts that come from a different part of their brain. They are cravings. Those craving thoughts come from an inner part of their body that is telling them they need certain, certain uh, things in the food that they don't know. But sometimes the mind associates it funnily. The mind seems to know which chemical is lacking. Of course, sometimes the mind, the, the mind conclude wrongly. Like the desire to eat dirt. 
no, no, maybe they might need, need something else rather than dirt. Not that they should eat dirt, but whatever dirt contained, they could find it in the food, then they might meet the need. The body is very clever. It speaks to you. So the cravings of a pregnant woman come from a different part of their brain. The thoughts about certain food. And they can't explain. Why? Because not from the cerebral cortex. Not from the prefrontal cortex. From another part of the brain. So you must be able to tell a different part of your brain called desire. The things that come from you. So your analytical thoughts, I'm trying to help you understand them. Analytical thoughts, your desiring type of thoughts, all come from different, different parts of your subconscious. But the most important is the part that float up from the spirit. Those thoughts that come, that seem to warn you, close to your conscience, but very intuitive. And we might have to have a lifetime of learning those thoughts. But as we learn to differentiate the different thoughts that arise from us, from time to time, and you learn to pay attention more to the one that comes from the spirit, the inner man, you will always make the right decision. You will always be empowered because that decision is powerful. It will even tell you how to get healed. And sometimes it can tell you things like last Friday all night, and now that was uh, just two nights ago when we were praying. Now, uh, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong, in turn, but I'm training myself to hear it correctly. Sometimes I will just ask God the question, how many people are there? And then straight away, the, the thoughts just flow, mm, just come out. And so when we were, we were having that special uh, Lord's Supper thing uh, that morning, I, how do I know? Because every time we pray and spend all night prayer, I know that there will be a group session. So I always ask the Lord, Lord, what would you like to do? How do I know what God wants to do? You think that God announced to me, and say, oh, this is what you do. God show me a scroll. This is what you must do today. Or whatever. No. What I receive is this constant flowing thoughts that say this is the thing that God wants. Sometimes I see in a vision. I see in a picture form of seeing myself act out certain things, do certain things. So I say, okay, I need to do that. And, uh, and so, so when I ask God as we're preparing the communion, every, the lights are all dark. No one knows how many people are there. And uh, so when I went out, I said, Lord, we're going to prepare communion. I want everyone to have it. You know? How many should I prepare? How many people are there? The Lord says, 25. Just like that. And then come 25, say, okay. Of, of course, the Lord also says some things. So when the Lord says something, I know that this is His voice. And I did give some prophecy and all that. But you learn to differentiate. In the end, what we all receive are thoughts here, thoughts there, thoughts here, everywhere. But now we learn that there are many types of thoughts. Just as some of you might learn there are many types of grass. There are many types of wonton noodle. There are one nicer than the other. Many types of bakute, clan bakute, Singapore bakute. So there are many types of thoughts you are having. So all the time you eat bakute, all the same, like black, white, yellow, brown, purple, all, all the same. And you realize, no, you must differentiate them. Understand, different one. When you taste your Singapore one, ah, the key is the pepper. You taste the clan one, the key is the herbs, black herbs. So each one different. And your thoughts that you have every day, you will find you can differentiate that. You can differentiate thoughts that come from the spirit, thoughts that come from your analytical mind, thoughts that come from your desire, thoughts that influence. And then each one you bring before God. And most of all, you ask the Lord, Lord, teach me all these thoughts that are coming. And I close with 2 Corinthians chapter 10. To live the empowered life, the power is within you. The power is within each one of you. The solution to your problem, solution to your situation, whether it be business situation, ministry situation, professional or personal situation, whether it be a situation that involves millions of dollars or situation that it just involves ten dollars, whether it be a situation to resolve with your loved ones or situation that is just within yourself, the key is to be able to flow with the right uh, area of thoughts that the Lord produced in you. It says in chapter 10, verse 3. Remember how we say how to walk in the Spirit. 
Here it says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to flesh. Implying that now this is the key to walk in the spirit and warfare in the spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought in the captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now here it talks about warfare and the key is all the different thoughts. You see, dealing with our world of thoughts that everyone of us has. We are living in a world of thoughts. These thoughts that occur all around you and within you the ability to deal with each one of them and classify them and, and, and understand each one of them and their source is your warfare. It's your spiritual battle and it's your warfare. If you cannot win this warfare, your life will not be powerfully empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does work, but the Spirit works from within us. And the empowered life is to live in your normal conscious life but living it empowered by the Spirit of God at the subconscious level. So the first key we share is last week was to be able to see everything as an illusion then you have the power to change it. Today is to be able to tap on your subconscious or your superconscious. Remember, I use the words in quotes for I understand it's not the power of the subconscious mind. That's not what we are heading for. That's new age. We are trying to get you to tap on the power of your inner man and your spirit. Uh, but when you use this scriptural language, people don't understand. When you use subconscious, then people straight away understand, okay, something within you. And every day when you wake up, even though your mind wakes up and conscious, you must always be Listening to what's in your subconscious. If only Joseph had listened to his subconscious. Of course, God would have brought him to Egypt probably in a different way. If only Isa and Jacob could listen to their subconscious. If only Samuel was listening more to his subconscious. His subconscious would be telling him, don't make, don't make your sons judges. They're not ready yet. His subconscious might have been telling him all those years, you're not showing enough love to your children. You're not spending enough time with them. You're not sitting them down and teaching them and training them. His subconscious will be talking to him. He might ignore those things and he hear another part about other things of the Lord. Maybe his visions. He always, you know, was obeying his vision. But there's so many other things that float. It is a warfare, the Bible says. It is a training. And like war, we need to learn how to win it. The power, and the correct way is to say, the power of the spirit in your subconscious. The power of the spirit in the subconscious. So that's to differentiate us from new age. But remember, even new age people without the Holy Spirit go far better. People who live by their subconscious has an advantage over those who live just by their conscious. Already in the normal field they will win. Much more those who go deeper and tap on their spirit subconscious, they will have an advantage even those because God is in that dimension of the spirit. Let's pray. Father, we ask Lord that you continue to teach us your word and your spirit. Father, we know we have been empowered to live this life as sons and daughters of God. We are empowered to be the salt of the earth, sons and daughters of God, leaders of the human race who do not know you. We're empowered to be the head and not the tail. We're empowered, O oh God, to be in health and not in sickness. We're empowered to be prosperous and not in poverty. We're empowered to have provision, O oh God. We're empowered to succeed and not to fail. We're empowered, O oh Father God, by your Spirit. And we know, Father, that even now your Spirit is working deep within each one of us. And you are helping us to differentiate the different quality of our inner thoughts. 
Where before, Lord, we never pay attention to the thoughts that flow through us. But your word says so clearly, it is a battlefield. We need to be able to catch, understand, tap upon the thoughts that flow from the spirit of our mind. Thank you, Father, that you seal this understanding upon our lives and cause us to rise to the place as sons and daughters of God. Thank you, Father. Seal this in Jesus' name. Amen.